I'm Rick Matson. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning's program. Um, before I do so, I want to uh, shout out a special award that uh, Dr. Warm, who's going to be one of our speakers this morning, has received. He's received one of the first UW CARES Award for his outstanding care, recognized generally across the whole UW system. So, Dr. Warm, congratulations. In 1990, my friend Steve Snyder uh, published an article on the slap lesion, and he described it as the result of a fall on an outstretched arm producing a painful catching or popping in the shoulder. And at that time, he felt that there was no imaging test that accurately enabled the diagnosis of this pathology preoperatively. It was essentially at that time an arthroscopic diagnosis. Subsequently, there has been a lot of interest in the use of MRI for making this uh, diagnosis. Uh, and one of the things that's of interest is that between 2004 and 2009, the rate with which this previously unidentified uh, entity has been repaired surgically effectively doubled. It's also been noted by my friend Dr. Steve Weber that the candidates for part two of the boards are report that they're performing slap repairs at three times the rate that one would guess from the published uh, data. So what we have is uh, something that didn't exist a few years back. Now it's being performed uh, as a repair uh, at a rapidly increasing rate. So we're going to have to rely heavily on our panel this morning to help uh, us understand what is a slap lesion and how it can be diagnosed and how it can be best treated and uh, the panel includes uh, our friend Nate Coleman, uh, who has a future in sports medicine, uh, our colleague Albert G, who's one of our sports medicine physicians, and Dr. Winston Warm, who's a member of the Shoulder Service. So with that introduction, I'd like to invite them to come up. And Nate, take it away. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Dr. Mattson, Dr. Warm, and Dr. Uh, G. We're going to be discussing superior labral tears in the shoulder, controversies, and uh, consensus. And as Dr. Uh, Matson so eloquently put, uh, we will also be discussing the origin of the slap tear. Um, the objectives of my part of the talk will be to discuss the anatomy of the superior labrum and an emphasis on the normal variations of it, as well as mechanism of injury, uh, classification of slap lesions uh, from Dr. Snyder to now, as well as the evaluation of slap lesions on physical exam and imaging. Uh, and we will move on with Dr. G and uh, <coughs> Dr. Warm to discuss the indications and treatment, uh, when to operate, and some of the controversies and consensus around treating these injuries. Uh, <clears throat> in background, Dr. Andrews, in 1985, was the first orthopedic surgeon to describe the tear of the superior glenoid labrum in overhead athletes and his patient population were primary high-level pitchers. Uh, Dr. Snyder, in 1990, was the first to coin the term slap lesion, which is a tear of the superior labrum in the anterior to posterior uh, direction, and uh, he classified the original four types, which we will discuss in a few minutes. I would first like to present you guys two cases uh, that you can think about while we continue with the grand rounds. The first case is a 19-year-old gymnast who felt a pop in his left shoulder during a tumbling routine. He now presents a deep shoulder pain that's worse with overhead activities. And on exam, he has full range of motion, full rotator cuff strength, but a positive O'Brien's test. His radiographs of his shoulder are normal. And here's his MRI that shows some irregularity of the superior labrum, uh, which looks to be like a type 2 slap lesion, which we will discuss in a few minutes. The second case is a 35-year-old male who's a former baseball player and presents uh, with several years of chronic deep right shoulder pain and is now a manual laborer. His pain in his shoulder is worse with heavy lifting and overhead activities, which his job <coughs> requires. He has uh, catching, uh, popping, and apprehension, especially with abduction and external rotation of his shoulder over his head. His exam reveals atrophy of the right infraspinatus muscle. He does have full range of motion of his shoulder, noted to be achieved after a uh, physical therapy uh, trial. Uh, he has weakness in his infraspinatus, as well as a positive O'Brien's test and a dynamic compression rotation test, 
uh, which is emphasized here where the shoulder is abducted uh, and externally rotated at, while you're loading the glenohumeral joint with axial traction. <clears throat> His images are also have unremarkable shoulder radiographs and an MR arthrogram that shows some irregularity of the superior labrum with a degenerative appearance and a superior uh, or a paralabral cyst in the location of the spinal glenoid notch where the subscapular nerve would be, or suprascapular nerve would be, sorry. So to continue on, we, to understand pathology, we need to understand what normal anatomy is at this location of the shoulder. In the glenoid labrum, it's a fibrocartilaginous structure. It's triangular and meniscoid in character. Here's a cross-section showing the triangular cross-section nature and meniscoid nature as it overhangs oftentimes the articular surface of the glenoid and inserts medial to the articular surface. So blood supply comes to the suprascapular artery and uh, the anterior and superior portions are relatively avascular. This is a slide showing the blood supply coming in uh, peripherally and at the site of insertion, it's relatively avascular. The most common attachment of the superior labrum is medial to the articular margin of the glenoid and it's intimate with the biceps tendon anchor which um, primarily inserts on the supraglenoid tubercle but the lateral 50% of it inserts into the posterior superior labrum most commonly. Here's a schematic showing that biceps tendon inserting into the glenoid as well as the labrum and its orientation uh, with respect to the MGHL, or the middle glenohumeral ligament, which will be important <coughs> to understand the normal anatomical variance of the anterior superior labrum. It's very important that we as orthopedic surgeons know how to evaluate these and have a high suspicion for normal variance in patients who have uh, an otherwise not straightforward presentation because fixing or uh, performing repairs on normal anatomy can lead to devastating consequences in the shoulder. Williams and Rao uh, et al. both have excellent articles describing three anatomic variants of the anterior superior capsule labral complex. The first one is a sublabral foramen or hole. It, happen, it exists at 3% of the time, and this is a, a, a detachment or a normal detachment of the uh, labrum from the glenoid. And Dr. Schneider also described these, and here's a schematic from one of his papers showing uh, a sublabel foramen with a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament, and this is the most common finding, and it exists 9% of the time. And then the Buford complex, which is an absent anterior superior labrum with a cord-like MGHL. <coughs> and uh, the arthroscopic view there from the posterior portal shows the absence of that labrum with the cord-like MGHL without any traumatic uh, or chronic findings uh, of trauma in the shoulder. The function of the superior labrum biceps complex is not fully understood, but we feel that it increases glenohumeral joint stability by increasing the diameter and depth of the glenoid, <laughs> as well as increasing the concavity compression forces or the suction effect of the ball and socket joint. Cadaver stu studies have revealed that it also increases torsional stability of the shoulder, especially in the abducted externally rotated position. It prevents anterior translation of the humerus on the glenoid. Uh, other studies that have, have shown that the peak uh, loads on the biceps superior labrum exist in the late cocking position as well as in the deceleration phase of throwing in tension. Andrews uh, first described the mechanism of injury to this to be a repetitive overhead throwing uh, mechanism and the deceleration follow-through th follow -through phase of throwing was the culprit for tension type failure of the superior labrum. Uh, Burkhart and Morgan in 1998 described the peelback mechanism of tearing where in a abducted externally rotated position peak torque loads uh, exist twisting the biceps tendon and peeling it off of the superior glenoid causing a superior labral tear. And then Snyder, uh, he felt that it was because of his patient population, he felt that an outstretched abducted arm being fallen on causes these types of tears. And the most common being a type 2, as I'll discuss in a second, is a 45 degree abducted arm out to the side. So then we'll talk about the classification of superior labral anterior posterior tears. Snyder, again, first described the four types. Moffitt added his five, type 5 through 7 
And since then, types 8 through 10 have also been described. We will focus on the first four types with, an uh, with one slide emphasizing <coughs> the importance of the other types of tears and why. Type 1 is a degenerative type tear where the superior labrum is frayed and degenerated without detachment of the biceps. Type 2 is the most common and it, it, it uh, has a detachment of the superior labrum and biceps from the superior glenoid. Type 3 is a more traumatic type lesion where there's a bucket handle tear of the superior labrum <laughs> but the biceps is intact. Type 4 is a bucket handle tear that involves the biceps and it detaches and displaces into the glenohumeral joint. Uh, type 6 is more along the lines of the first four types as it is a detachment of the labrum like a type 2 with a flap tear that displaces into the glenohumeral joint. It's important to mention types 5, 7 through 10 because it has associated capsule labral pathology which can lead to shoulder instability so it's very important to assess for shoulder instability when having a high suspicion for slap lesions. And just a quick slide to explain these. Type 5 is a bank heart lesion with a slap tear. Type 7 is a slap tear that extends into the MGHL. Type 7 is a reverse bank heart or posterior labral tear with a slap. Type 9 is a 360 degree detachment of the labrum from the glenoid. And type 10 is a slap lesion that extends into the superior glenohumeral ligament. So. Now that you can understand what these look like, how do they look on imaging? Well, you need to get routine radio, shoulder radiographs to rule out any other source of pain. Uh, an MRI is the gold standard for imaging. Um, and M traditional MRI sensitivity is between 63 and 84%. An MR arthrogram is more sensitive, looking in the radiology literature, um, at, can be as sensitive as 95%. Although, please note this is a difficult location to image and the findings, I think it's important to look for contrast within the superior labrum and maybe underneath the superior labrum. Does it extend into the biceps tendon? Is there a cyst? And look for associated pathologies such as rotator cuff tears or capsule labral injuries. And always be cognizant of normal variants. Here's a coronal MRI that shows a or, uh, some contrast maybe in the posterior superior labrum, although this is not contrast. This is just the normal variation between the fibrocartilaginous labrum and the hyaline cartilage of the glenoid. Here's a sublabral recess, which could be called a type 2 lesion, emphasizing the difficulty of diagnosing these lesions on MRI. This contrast follows the contour of the glenoid and does not extend into the superior labrum. And here is a Buford complex where the anterior superior labrum is absent with a cord like MGHL. Looks a lot like a tear or a bank heart lesion. So I would ask you, normal or abnormal? And just think about this as we uh, continue on with our discussion. And here is an MRI that's clearly abnormal showing detachment of the superior labrum with detachment and 100% disruption of the biceps pulling off of the glenoid. So the take home points of my portion of the talk Please appreciate normal variant anatomy of the superior labrum. No different mechanism, different mechanisms of injury and that these can lead to slap lesions that are not all the same. And also have an idea of what to look for on MRI. Understand this is a difficult place to image and please correlate with the history and examination of the patient. Uh, next I'd like to introduce Dr. G who's going to talk about his uh, method for evaluating and uh, treating patients with slap lesions. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about these controversies now. And uh, as we all know, here in Seattle, uh, controversy is not always a bad thing. <clears throat> um, excuse me just a second. There seems to be something off here. OK. <clears throat> but I think it's more kind of confusion here that we're, we're, we're uh, encountering when, when it comes to these uh, slap tears, and although there's a lot of data and there's quite a few studies out there, uh, the literature is not always clear on uh, best management principle uh, for these injuries. <clears throat> so let's talk about controversy or confusion, whichever way you want to you want to kind of uh, phrase it. And as Dr. Uh, Coleman has illustrated for us, the anatomy is quite variable. So sublabral recess, sublabral foramen, a Buford complex, these can all contribute to. 
uh, difficulties identifying what's the actual normal situation and what's the actual pathologic situation. Uh, at the same time, uh, Dr. Coleman also touched on this, there's 10 slap types. Um, you know, if I were tested on some of the more rare ones, I don't think I'd be able to identify them all without a, without a chart. So, you know, this again is another reason why there's quite a bit of confusion, I think, about these injuries. Uh, these tears can vary based on uh, the age of the patient. Uh, type 1 tears are, are often uh, seen in older patients, whereas type 3 and 4 are more in, uh, seen in younger patients. <clears throat> um, there's uh, often coexistent pathology in the shoulder. Uh, this is a nice study uh, from uh, the uh, JBGS in 2003, uh, in which they looked at 130, uh, 139 cases uh, of arthroscopically proven uh, superior labral tears, and what they found was that 88% of the time there was coexistent shoulder pathology. And this included long head of the biceps uh, abnormalities, uh, bank heart lesions, rotator cuff tears, AC joint arthritis, glenohumeral joint arthritis. So uh, on top of that, we have variable presentations and variable mechanisms for injury. So uh, as uh, Dr. Coleman had already introduced a, a bit, uh, compression loads across the glenoid uh, uh, when you fall on an outstretched uh, arm can lead to these injuries. A traction type injury on the biceps can also be a culprit. Uh, oftentimes, overhead athletes will uh, present with superior labral uh, abnormalities. And it doesn't always have to be from, a, from an acute trauma that the patient can recall. So on top of that, uh, we have a variety of physical exam tests out there that try to pinpoint this lesion. Um, uh, and they include things like the O'Brien's test, which I think is one of the more common tests that's performed. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just kind of want to illustrate for you that there are several tests close to 10, I believe, uh, uh, trying to isolate the superior labrum uh, and uh, define pathology there on the physical exam. There's the dynamic labral shear test, as Dr. Uh, Coleman had pointed out. There's the biceps load test. There's the speeds test. Uh, and kind of most importantly, I think, um, there have been shown in multiple studies now that these uh, tests, unfortunately, have uh, fairly poor specificity and sensitivity when it comes to identifying the slap tear. And so they're not entirely accurate in terms of pinpointing this, uh, in, in terms of pinpointing this lesion. <clears throat> on top of that, uh, we have quite a bit of uh, variation and debate on what uh, treatments uh, uh, these uh, should undergo if and when they get to surgery. Uh, uh, we debride the labrum sometimes. We oftentimes repair it. Uh, sometimes the biceps tenotomy or tenodesis is performed. And again, like Dr. Coleman had, had mentioned, there's quite a few associated lesions, and how do you address those at the time of arthroscopy or open surgery? So as Dr. Uh, Madsen uh, uh, introduced us to at the beginning, um, there's some uh, increasing uh, uh, incidence of the repairs. And like he said, it's, it's doubled almost in the last five to seven years. And we know uh, that these tears in isolation are not uh, very common. Uh, we know that from Snyder's original series of, I think, roughly over 2,500 shoulder arthroscopies, he was able to identify only a 6% slap uh, prevalence. So uh, rates as high as what we're seeing here um, are, are a little bit worrisome. These are two recent studies that came out last year. Um, the one on, the, uh, on your uh, left is based on the Sparks database. Uh, the one on the right is the Pearl Diver database. Both are healthcare industry databases <laughs> that track CPT codes and uh, patient health information. And they found uh, significant increases in the number of uh, slap repairs that are being performed from year to year. <clears throat> so I think. More than ever, this is a uh, very important time to understand what's the right way to kind of identify these, which ones are the ones that you're going to make better if you treat them <laughs> with surgery. Uh, and so I think clinical decision making is, is uh, a very big uh, point here. And I had a, a mentor at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Kelly, who is a sports and shoulder surgeon that said, don't be a slapaholic. So I think that's going to be kind of my message for, for the audience here. Um, and that's going to require that uh, patient selection is uh, carefully thought about. 
in that we try to uh, identify what I like to call clinically relevant slap tears <coughs> uh, amongst the sea of kind of confusion that I just illustrated. So how do we do that? Well, just like anything in orthopedics, we do the history, we take a uh, thorough examination, and then we look at uh, appropriate imaging. And to start, um, a, uh, a history, uh, first and foremost, should take into consideration the patient's age, uh, pain, mechanical symptoms are often accompanying this uh, injury. Uh, they can have uh, acute or traumatic onset. Uh, otherwise, they can have chronic or more insidious onset. The duration is important. Mechanisms of injury, like we discussed. Overhead athletes, I think, are a special population that we need to talk about a bit here. Uh, the patient's activity level, uh, weakness that the patient might describe, as well as gender. And I know this is a laundry list, so I try to pinpoint the ones that I think are the most um, um, kind of important and the ones that I stress when I'm evaluating a patient that I, might, uh, that I believe might have a superior labral tear. So let's talk a little bit more about these in detail. So age, uh, the literature has kind of used 40 years as a cutoff between those patients that we consider to be quote unquote young and those that are, I guess, considered to be quote unquote older. Um, uh, so a lot of the studies you'll see will divide patients based on, on this kind of arbitrary number. Um, and so I bring that up here so that everybody understands that that's, that's how those numbers come about. Um, most of the time, again, there's no uh, hard and fast rules here, but uh, younger patients are more likely to have quote unquote relevant slap tears. Older patients are more often uh, uh, um, gonna have age-related degeneration. Uh, in terms of pain, Patients often describe a deep uh, and poorly localized pain. Uh, it's often more uh, noticeable with overhead activities. And here I want to stress that uh, we should try to bring out any uh, history of anterior shoulder pain uh, and pain that might radiate down the arm along the uh, length of the biceps. And I do that because I think, I don't know if it projects there, I'm not sure why it came out in black, but you want to be able to distinguish lesions that are affecting the superior labrum and you want to be able to differentiate those from those that may be coming from the biceps, because I think that'll be important in terms of how you treat these folks uh, at the time of surgery. <clears throat> um, again, acute versus traumatic, uh, acute and traumatic lesions are usually more clinically relevant uh, versus those that are of gradual onset. Again, the overhead athlete uh, I wanted to kind of uh, focus on. Uh, the kind of quintessential overhead athlete is the baseball pitcher, uh, obviously swimmers, tennis, handball, javelin, uh, there's other uh, sports in which this applies. Um, and what they often complain of is, at least in the case of a pitcher, is a loss of velocity. And they'll often also uh, complain of, of uh, problems with location. Uh, and this is what was historically known as uh, the dead arm syndrome in a pitcher. <clears throat> Moving on to weakness, um, shoulder rotation can be affected uh, in the case of a spinal glenoid notch cyst, uh, as Dr. Coleman had brought up, uh, in those cases, you're worried about nerve compression, so I do ask about weakness when I'm worried about a slap tear. Uh, and in terms of gender, males are more uh, susceptible to these lesions and are, uh, um, than are females. So assuming uh, that we have a thorough history that's leading us down the road of a uh, slap tear, we need to go on to the examination, obviously. Don't forget about the C-spine. Uh, there are oftentimes, or not oftentimes, but there are times when the uh, C-spine uh, abnormalities can lead to referred shoulder pain. When you focus on the shoulder, you're looking for symmetry. Uh, scapular motion, especially in overhead athletes, can be something uh, that can be dysfunctional. You should be looking out for that. You're looking for palpable tenderness, and this includes the rotator cuff over the AC joint. And again, uh, emphasis on the biceps groove to try to differentiate superior labral pathology that's causing the shoulder pain versus uh, proximal biceps pain. Uh, moving on, you want to do a full range of motion exam. And again, <clears throat> to bring the overhead athlete back in, um, you want to see how much their rotation is affected. Uh, and by comparing the uh, uh, dominant side to the, uh, to the non-dominant side, uh, you can get a sense of uh, what their rotational motion is. Um, the focus here is on checking to see if, there's a, a, uh, uh, if the patient has tightness in his posterior capsule, which many people believe is kind of the essential lesion that leads down the path of 
pathomechanics uh, leading to slap tears in patients uh, who are overhead athletes. Um, strength, you're looking for rotator cuff weakness again. The cysts can cause uh, compression of the nerve, give you some uh, uh, weakness in external rotation. And again, I often do a couple uh, provocative slap tests knowing full well that these are not necessarily accurate, but they do give me a flavor that this is something that uh, um, I'm considering in, in my differential. Moving on, uh, we get appropriate imaging. Uh, X-rays, again, as Dr. Coleman had mentioned, are important for ruling out things like arthritis, uh, but the uh, gold standard here is MRI. Uh, again, it's not perfect. Arthrograms seem to improve the diagnostic uh, uh, sensitivity uh, and specificity. Again, spinoglenoid notch cysts are uh, a clue that you have a, a significant labral tear. Uh, and again, you want to be looking out for associated uh, injuries or pathologies involving the cuff, instability lesions, or potentially affecting the cartilage. So assuming that you have a clinically relevant slap lesion, uh, the first step is not surgery. Uh, almost in every case that I see a slap lesion that I think is causing pain and symptoms, I start with uh, non-surgical treatment options. <clears throat> and those include uh, rest, shutting down the uh, overhead athlete, uh, checking his motion, seeing if he has any of those deficits in his glenohumeral rotation, if he does, working on stretching, and then gradually getting him back. Uh, using a graduated throwing program, uh, physical therapy, obviously a range of motion, cuff strength, scapular stabilization is all part of a good and well-rounded uh, shoulder program. Uh, again, in the overhead athlete, you're looking at the kinetic chain um, and uh, sleeper stretches, addressing the posterior capsule here, being uh, di uh, illustrated by this uh, patient. Uh, this uh, stabilizes the scapula against the table, and then the uh, contralateral uh, hand is used to bring the uh, glenohumeral joint into internal rotation, uh, and that helps to stretch the posterior capsule. Uh, the only exception I make to uh, uh, non-surgical treatments as kind of my first line uh, is in the case of these spin spinal glenoid notch cysts, uh, especially in the setting of uh, external rotation weakness or uh, 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 muscle uh, involvement that you can sometimes pick up subtly on the MRI. Uh, I'll, attack, I'll kind of go after these more aggressively, uh, foregoing the uh, physical therapy and the non-surgical modalities, because uh, I want to be able to uh, decompress the cyst and get the nerve back. Uh, surprisingly, uh, as far as I <clears throat> understand the literature, there's only one real uh, study looking at non-surgical outcomes uh, for slap uh, injuries. Uh, and it has a total of 15 overhead athletes in it. Uh, they did a, um, a physical therapy program, which included stretching, strengthening, uh, scapular stabilizing, uh, exercises, and they were able to get 10 out of the 15 patients, or 10 of the 15 athletes, back to their pre-injury level of activity. <clears throat> so in the situations when non-op uh, treatment uh, fails us, the patient is still symptomatic, at that point I think it makes sense to start discussing surgical treatment options. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to skip over surgeries because uh, Dr. Worm is going to uh, address those, but I do want to talk a bit about the outcomes here. <clears throat> um, so this is a, uh, a fairly early study um, in terms of superior labral lesions that were addressed arthroscopically. This is from JBJS in 2002. And uh, these uh, researchers looked at 34 uh, patients. This was a case series of isolated slap tears that they repaired with a suture anchor. Uh, the mean age was 26, so a fairly young patient population. And they were able to get 94% uh, satisfactory uh, scores on the uh, UCLA outcome measure. And 91% of their patients were able to return to pre-injury levels. However, they did note that those uh, uh, patients that did uh, poorer, if you will, poorer on the uh, outcome measures as well as in terms of being able to get, get back to their pre-injury level of activity were oftentimes overhead athletes. A more recent study, uh, again in JBJS in 2009, um, again this was, a, uh, this was a prospectively collected case series of 47 uh, slap tears, again isolated tears, a slightly older patient population with a mean age of 36. Uh, they found 87% good to quote-unquote excellent results by ASCS and Lensalata scores, uh, 
uh, and they were able to get 71% return to play in their overhead athletes. So again, the overhead athlete has a difficult time coming back from, uh, from these types of injuries. So I wanted to bring this uh, study up as well to kind of um, delve deeper into those overhead athletes. This is from uh, AJSM in 2011. Again, a very small case series of what they termed elite overhead athletes, and by that they meant overhead athletes at the college and professional level. Mean age was 36, and they were able to show that they had 96% good to excellent outcomes by ASES score. But only 57% of these athletes were able to get back to their pre-injury level of sport, uh, and they were able to correlate the presence of a partial cuff tear uh, with that poor return to, to play uh, uh, value. Uh, what's interesting is the authors in this uh, study uh, note that uh, the ASES is perhaps not a great outcome measure for these elite athletes uh, when we're talking about returning to activities, returning to their normal sports after a slap injury. <clears throat> uh, two more studies to touch on. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the larger case series that I've found on, on slap repairs. Uh, 107 isolated slaps. Uh, they had 62 patients in this study that were over the age of 40, so they were able to uh, generate two groups for comparison's sake. They were able to find that 88% uh, uh, good to excellent satisfaction at five years across both groups, but they did note a 13.1% post-op stiffness rate. And when they compared their outcomes, which I think were uh, satisfaction, patient satisfaction and row outcome scores, uh, they showed no difference between the two groups, meaning those that are older than 40 years old and those that are younger. But as a uh, cohort of 107 patients in general, they showed a 13.1% stiffness, uh, post-op stiffness rate. Uh, finally, uh, I thought this uh, study was interesting, and I wanted to bring it to everybody's attention here. This is a randomized controlled uh, trial of patients over the age of 50 with uh, rotator cuff tears. They had 63 patients with cuff tears that they felt were amenable to repair at the time of arthroscopy. Uh, the mean age of these patients was 65. So they were able to divide the um, patients up into two groups that they obviously randomized. Uh, in which uh, they fixed the rotator cuff in all patients, but then they would either debreed or, or excuse me, release the biceps, just do a, a plain biceps tenotomy versus repair the actual slap lesion. And what they found, interesting, they found that the tenotomy group actually had better outcomes uh, by uh, range of motion. So they had better range of motion after surgery and uh, uh, UCLA um, um, outcome measures, uh, and this was at about five years after surgery. So they uh, concluded that there was no advantage to repairing the slap in this setting. So just to kind of summarize what that all meant, in my mind it means that clinically relevant slap tears, if you uh, have them and they fail non-surgical treatment options, that surgical repair is a fairly efficacious surgery. Uh, the importance kind of in that statement is that you are identifying those that are clinically relevant. Um, uh, the overhead athlete has a harder time getting back from these types of injuries, uh, and that potentially in the older patient population, postoperative stiffness may be a potential problem. Uh, there are many studies, I just showed you one, where they tried to compare older versus younger patients when it came to slap repairs. Um, all, were not, all were unable to show a significant difference in terms of outcomes. Um, they're usually small numbered studies, 40, 50 patients at most, so I don't think they're powered adequately to do that, but there always seems to be a trend that perhaps those patients who are over the age of 40, 50 years old uh, are not going to do as well. They're going to have more problems with postoperative stiffness uh, and potentially postoperative pain. So I, I, the message there in my mind is to kind of think a little bit more about those patients before you sign them up for surgery. So to uh, drive home some take-home points here, uh, slap tears are confusing, and there is some controversy there. Um, um, I think it's very important that you identify those slap tears that are quote-unquote clinically relevant that you think will get better uh, with uh, treatment. Uh, that involves a detailed history, a full exam, appropriate imaging. <clears throat> if you find such lesion, I think the first line in almost every patient is to try uh, a course of non-surgical uh, modalities. Uh, then if that fails, 
uh, surgery may be an option, and in those patients that you've selected appropriately, they usually have pretty good outcomes. The overhead <coughs> athlete has a bit of a guarded prognosis when it comes to uh, return to pre-injury level. And finally, don't be a slapaholic. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Warm come up and uh, talk a little bit more about how he approaches these lesions surgically. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a fantastic introduction and uh, also literature review highlighting how important it is to determine what's clinically relevant in terms of these lesions. And uh, this is a topic that I approach with a fair bit of humility because, as has been mentioned, it's difficult to really understand how all the, the components of the shoulder relate to one another, even at this time. Uh, but I think we can take home some guiding principles for the management of patients that have these types of lesions. And uh, we're well on our way with the previous two speakers' comments. Nate has uh, emphasized how important it is to identify normal from abnormal. And clearly, uh, if we don't know the difference, we can do surgeries that are not indicated. If we get the MRI reading back and it says there's a slap tear, we have to determine whether or not that, in fact, is clinically relevant. And I think that uh, Albert did a fantastic job of bringing that up, and I like his, his terminology there of a clinically relevant tear. You can see on your left here that it looks like very minor involvement, perhaps, of the, uh, of the superior labrum. And it, what we want to do is, at surgery, we want to really probe on the inferior portion, see if it's really loose, push down on the bicep, see if the labrum hangs over the top of the glenoid. If neither of these things happen, it's unlikely to be a clinically relevant problem. We don't want to fix sublabial foramen, as has already been said. What are the slap tears, then, that we should consider fixing? Well, when they're extensions from some sort of traumatic problem that's giving us anterior or posterior instability, it makes sense to me uh, to fix these slap tears because it's just part of the instability problem. Also, if there's paralabral cysts involved, that's an indication to fix these quickly, as has already been mentioned. And then the overhead athlete or the worker who's got their motion back, doesn't have an internal rotation deficit, they have good scapular motion, they may, in fact, benefit from a labral repair. And you don't have to be an overhead athlete to get this. If you have an appropriate mechanism of injury, uh, you can still develop these types of tears. And if you don't improve with therapy, then surgery may be indicated. So to just go over some of these lesions that we see in the shoulder, we can have bony bank heart lesions. In this case, the bony portion was loose and was removed. But you can see the bank heart tear there. And the extension into a slap tear is something we want to fix. If we get a, a bony bank heart lesion like this, you can see the probe comes off the glenoid hits a bony bank heart, which has been healed in a malunited position, this type of situation will require an osteotomy and then appropriate mobilization of that bone block and the soft tissues in order to effect a good repair. And uh, this is an example of how we mobilize that tissue. You can see that whole anterior capsule labral complex can be moved up and then repaired appropriately uh, with a very rigid fixation technique, uh, which is going to give them a lot of resistance to late anterior translation. Posterior tear similarly can be uh, a variety of shapes and sizes. Sometimes they'll be just tears that can be debrided, but other times they'll be ones that we need to repair. And uh, in these cases, we try to get the labrum back where it belongs, rigid fixation, try to keep the knots away from the articular surface and fix the reverse bank heart lesion in addition to the slap tear. So I think it makes sense to fix these types of slap tears. Uh, we talked a little bit about paralabral cysts and those two uh, are slap tears that I believe are clinically relevant. Now the, you can think of the labrum as somewhat of an O-ring 
and it forms a seal around the glenoid, and that seal, when it's broken, can be problematic. And in this case, we have an MRI and intraoperative findings of a superior labral tear where fluid has leaked out and is forming a ganglion cyst in the spinal glenoid notch. An illustrative case here is of a young college student who's a rower and a rock climber. And uh, without any known trauma that he can recall, developed this non-dominant shoulder pain and weakness. He saw a variety of physicians and they tried therapy. He really had no improvement. And he came and saw us. We noted that he had full range of motion. He had a stable shoulder on examination, but he had some positive slap tests, normal radiographs. Most important was the fact that he had this infraspinatus atrophy. And when he was performing resisted external rotation, you can see this perhaps even more. It's a quick review of what the nerve looks like. The suprascapular nerve runs through the uh, scapular notch and then through the spinal glenoid notch where it's at risk for these ganglia. So our diagnosis in this young man was that he had likely a posterior labral tear with a spinal glenoid notch paralabral cyst. So we ordered an MRI to confirm that diagnosis, and in fact, it's readily seen. On the left here, you can see the crack, and then on the right, the fluid extending through the crack into the spinal glenoid notch, and hard to miss this one on these axial views or on these coronal views. Very large cyst with potential uh, compromise to the nerve. And I think this slide identifies very nicely the changes within the infraspinatus muscle itself. Not only is there atrophy, but there's a change in the color uh, and consistency of the muscle. So this is a type of injury that we want to operate on right away, not necessarily waste any time with physical therapy because we've got a nerve at risk. So this is uh, pictures taken with the arthroscope in the front. And the instrument is also coming in from the front. And what we're doing is uh, elevating this tissue, getting down into the cyst. And then with some gentle pressure from the back, we can push and massage on that cyst. And eventually, we'll start to see some of this cyst-like fluid come out. Oftentimes, this fluid will be thick and gelatinous, like we see in ganglia at the wrist and other places. And of course, uh, we know that this is going to make the nerve feel a lot better. So we put in some anchors then with a very steep trajectory. And uh, then we'll get very rigid fixation again with these suture anchors, tying the knots well away from the articular surface. And then. Uh, we can hope for then a good recovery if we've decompressed the nerve rather quickly, adequately repaired the labrum, and then do some gentle, slow therapy and return to activity, very likely to get a good result as we got in this patient with which you can see restored bulk of his infraspinatus muscle. And on this little video here, when he's doing external rotation against resistance, uh, we can see that his infraspinatus is once again very strong. So these two categories, I think, are slap labral or slap tears that we want to fix. Now talking a little bit about the overhead athlete or the overhead worker who has uh, restored motion. They don't have any kind of internal rotation deficit, uh, but they've got this symptomatic and clinically relevant slap tear. In this case, you can see a superior labral tear that's quite lax. We can lift it easily away from the superior part of the glenoid. And so that's stabilized also with a few anchors. And you can see that the biceps tendon is rigidly fixed. We haven't changed the orientation of the biceps. And uh, we haven't caused any kinking in it, which is also very important to just repair it anatomically. Finally, we can have a non-overhead athlete or a normal person, perhaps, who has a good mechanism and has failed therapy. So that's another person who would be a good candidate for a slap tear. And in this case, we had a gentleman uh, 
uh, who got into it with a rototiller, and uh, this rototiller tried to get away from him. He didn't let go, and he sustained an injury with subsequent deep pain in his shoulder and recurrent clicking. You can see on the left there that there's a labral tear, and then his biceps tendon appears to be in pretty good shape. Uh, but certainly, I think we can conclude that the rototiller won round one of this uh, altercation. Uh, the labrum is very lax and easily lifted off of the superior portion of the glenoid. There's some splits within the tissue of the superior labrum. And uh, we decorticated that and then repaired that for him. And he went back to utilizing his rototiller ad libitum and uh, won this match. So. You can get a good result in patients uh, if these are clinically relevant and you take care of them appropriately. Now, which slap tears do we not want to fix? And these, this is very important, just as important as know when to do surgery, when not to do surgery. Certainly, uh, we've already emphasized you have to know what normal variation <coughs> looks like and avoid fixing those. Degenerative and frayed labrum tears are not indicated for repair and are better just simply debrided. And has been highlighted already, the at-risk shoulder should be identified early, and we need to take special care before we perform surgery on patients who are prone to postoperative stiffness. We have to think about diabetic patients and also those of advancing age, and also patients who, for some reason or other, are going to have difficulty attending physical therapy and getting their motion back in their shoulder. In patients, has been mentioned, in rotator cuff tears, it's unlikely to need to do a labral repair. So this is an interesting case that should illustrate a few points. A professional rock climber who has having a lot of pain in the shoulder, inability to train hard and improve in terms of her climbing. Uh, she has pain in catching in her shoulder. She has anterior pain that radiates into her biceps. She has some positive slap signs and a stable shoulder on examination. And this MRI shows some changes within the substance of the superior labrum. And further views of the MRI show not only does she have a superior labral abnormality and clear degeneration and fraying of that tissue, but also a partial articular sided rotator cuff tear. So how are we going to manage this patient? Uh, we have to uh, look at everything that's involved in the shoulder. And as we take a tour in here, most of the labrum and glenoid surface looks good, with the exception of the superior labrum, which is better seen on, on these photos. And there's a lot of fraying and degeneration, even involving uh, the root of the biceps tendon. There's some synovitis, uh, which shows you that the shoulder is quite irritated. That <coughs> synovitis is removed, and the, the labral tear is cleaned up. We follow the biceps tendon up to and look very closely at the rotator cuff. And in this case, as you can see in the upper right, there is a partial thickness articular sided supraspinatus tear. But the remainder of the cuff looks pretty good as we come around in the shoulder. So we debrided that cuff, uh, decorticated the greater tuberosity, performed a microfracture, and she was able to return to top form and uh, advance her climbing to the 514B range and uh, return to World Cup competitions uh, and is doing very, very well. So what about partial fraying or tearing of the long head of the biceps tendon? And is this a harbinger of doom? Is the tendon going to die or tear or does it need to be cut as some are fond of doing? And I would say, getting back to Dr. G's comments, it's so important to examine the patient and really listen to what they're saying in terms of their bicep pain and examine that area of the body and not just focus on the shoulder, but think about the biceps. If there aren't clear bicep signs on physical exam, and we like the bicep saw test, we find that to be quite helpful, then just clean the biceps tendon up. It's not always a pain generator, as is fondly said, uh, at a lot of other institutions. So this is a patient who was taken to the operating room not to uh, take care of his uh, biceps tendon per se. Uh, he didn't really have any biceps tendon symptoms. Uh, but at surgery, we found this frayed <coughs> superior labrum. As we look on the photo on the right there, it looks like the top of his biceps tendon looks quite good. But when we look at the root of the biceps tendon, uh, 
That doesn't look so good. And on the slide on the right there, there's actually a flap of the biceps that's hanging down and uh, not looking too healthy. And uh, so in this video, it's a short little clip, but you can see how involved that biceps tendon is. And just as a show of hands of curiosity, <laughs> is there anyone in the audience that would consider a biceps tenotomy for this patient? Just raise your hands if you would. A couple patients. What about a biceps tenodesis, something like that? Maybe a few more hands. Thank you. Well, I thought of that too. Uh, but it turns out that this patient uh, was a very uh, active bodybuilder and uh, was training for competition, so we didn't do anything to his biceps tendon. He was able to continue to train pretty hard and went on to win the master's level uh, bodybuilding championship in our state later that year. So I'm pretty glad I didn't do anything to his biceps tendon. Uh, so there's this continuum of laxity also we find in patients from uh, the, the very young to the very old. And so we have to keep this in mind as we're treating these patients as well. And uh, there's some patients that are extremely loose. We, uh, my partner Rick is fond of saying there's patients that are born loose and there are patients that are torn loose. And it's helpful to think about that as you uh, think about how you're going to manage patients. So in the slide on the left, a patient like this is not very prone to stiffness. And as we get to patients on the right who are a little bit older, uh, still pretty active, they may have more difficulties getting their motion back. And this was illustrated by a case I took care of earlier this week of a lovely 40-year-old uh, patient who happened to have diabetes and had a slap tear repaired elsewhere and uh, went on to develop recalcitrant stiffness in the shoulder. And she came to me with a shoulder with missing motion in every plane. And uh, we felt like we needed to do something to help her. She'd failed exhaustive physical therapy. And as you can see, the remnants of some anchors there at the top of the superior labrum and a lot of scarring. Uh, here we see a lot of synovitis in the anterior shoulder and also these thick scar bands on the slide on your right. These needed to be taken down and a full capsular release needed to be uh, undertaken in order to get her motion back, which she now has, and hopefully she'll be able to keep. So we have to remember that slap repairs are shoulder tightening operations and can be complicated by aggressive uh, scar formation. Now in the setting of a superior labral tear and a full thickness cuff tear, again, we need to be thoughtful about the predisposition to scarring and stiffness late. And on the slide on the right, you can see a lot of synovitis. Uh, even on the slide on the left there, you can see in the cuff defect, there's some synovitis right over the top of the biceps tendon. So in these cases, we're going to probably just debride the labral tear and do a good cuff repair. And that should serve the patient very well. Uh, they'll be able to just rehab after one surgery, which simplifies things a great deal. In cases of patients who have multiple pathologies ongoing in their shoulder, again, we have to be thoughtful before we repair these labral tears. This gentleman had pain in his biceps tendon. It was radiating into the biceps muscle. You can see fraying of the long head of the biceps tendon on the left, synovitis surrounding that, also a superior labral tear. Uh, this person had a full thickness rotator cuff tear and degenerative changes that were symptomatic in the acromioclavicular joint. So this patient, we just cleaned up the labrum, we did a biceps tenodesis, and we did a distal clavicle resection arthroscopically as well as an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. So in review, the tears we want to fix are extensions of instability injuries, those that are associated with paralabral cysts, Overhead athletes who've gotten their motion back no longer have abnormal scapular kinematics uh, and normal patients who have a good mechanism and a symptomatic, clinically relevant slap tear. Ones we're going to avoid fixing are normal variants, of course, patients who have degenerative labral tears, and patients who are at risk for postoperative stiffness and likely in patients with full thickness cuff tears that require repair, we're not going to fix those. Thank you very much.